Thanks, Becca, and thanks for inviting me here to uh, talk with you all. Uh, I'm going to be talking today about situation awareness in healthcare. Now, situation awareness is a term that we've been studying in earnest since about the mid 80s. It came out of the uh, aviation industry where pilots were very concerned about maintaining an awareness of everything that was happening around them. Since then, it's really expanded into a lot of other domains, including air traffic control, military systems, power systems, and a lot more recently into the healthcare arena. A lot of the examples I'm going to talk about today uh, come from some of these different domain areas, but also be able to talk about how it specifically applies in various aspects of, of healthcare. So, first of all, what is situation awareness? Um, a lot of people think it's just knowing a lot of stuff, and, and really it's more than that. Uh, we talk about situation awareness often in three levels. At the first level, you do have to have perception of the basic data or information. So, you have to see it, hear it, smell it. I mean, you can get the information through a lot of senses, but you have to get the critical information that matters. But situation awareness is more than that. It's about putting it all together and understanding the meaning of that. So it's, it's putting two and two together to get four, understanding the so what or, or, or comprehension of the information. And I liken it to a reading comprehension test. It's, it's sort of the difference between being able to read the, the words and being able to understand the meaning of that or the so what of that information. And then we find it at the third and highest level of situation awareness that people who are really good at situation awareness not only understand what's happening right now, but they're able to project, at least into the near future, what, what's fixing to happen in, in, in uh, the near future with that system. So that sort of forms the basic definition of situation awareness. And that really is sort of this integrated understanding that forms the basis for decision making and actions in a wide variety of domains. Now, we developed this, this topic, uh, or this uh, definition back in the 80s, uh, working with pilots. And I've found since that time that it really applies equally well in, in every other domain that I've gone into. But what changes is just what you have to be able to perceive, comprehend, and project. So for example, to talk about it in the, in the healthcare arena, when we talk about perception, what are the things they need to perceive? Well, it could be anything from their vital signs, like blood pressure, heart rate, O2 sat. Um, but it's also the rate of change in that information. How are those things changing and trending over time? It could be um, information that's it's a lot more um, qualitative, so things like their appearance, um, things like what sort of medications are they taking, their prior history up until that time. All of those things form sort of this basic perceptual information that uh, physicians or nurses are trying to understand uh, at any given time. We then have the comprehension, the, the so what. What does that mean, information really mean? In the healthcare arena, very often that's diagnosis of patient condition. What, what is my diagnosis of what's happening? But it's also a lot of other things. It could be things like how does this, um, what's the impact of a condition on their overall health? What, what effect is that having? Uh, what's the impact of other factors on that, on that condition? So they may want to know things like what's the impact of this particular medication or intervention that's been prescribed? How is that affecting their condition? And then project in it, projection is what's happening over time. So very often that might be the, the, the prognosis of a disease, but it's also things like projected uh, critical events or what impact um, act, those actions are having on the disease state and patient state. So you're really looking at this in a very dynamic uh, time sense uh, to understand what's going on with that individual. Now there are a lot of challenges for situation awareness in the healthcare arena, and I'll hit on just some of them. One of the biggest problems is that it, this is a, an environment where you have inherently very messy data. So we first of all have the situation that all patients are not alike. Um, you have a lot of variability across patients in terms of their underlying physiology, how they may react to different drugs. Um, there, there's just a lot of, of differences there. One particular medication will work great for one person and not for another, for instance, or they may have different side effects. Um, there are many um, hidden or unreported symptoms. Uh, so uh, one of the challenges we have is that um, patients are often not the best reporters of this information. They can give you bits and parts of it. Um, they can change over time in terms of what they're willing to talk about. Uh, so just getting that information out of patients and understanding what kinds of symptoms they're having can be a significant challenge. Uh, many conditions may have very different symptoms, so you have to try and figure out what conditions are, are, are leading to those symptoms. And then on the opposite side, those symptoms can vary across patients even when they have the same condition. So there's a lot of inherent variability associated with what's going on. And then we have the challenge that we can have very high error rates. So uh, even if you're, you're hooked up to monitors, um, there's a lot of noise in that data. You can have high error rates in terms of alarms. 
you can have high error rates in terms of tests that are given. So you could, you could administer the test for Lyme disease, for instance, and that's, that only has a 80% um, reliability rate. You have a 20% could be a, a, false, a false negative. So we just have a, a problem with not getting good, accurate data necessarily coming to the individual. That information flow is also very, very noisy. Um, we know we have a, an issue with inconsistent transmission of information across organizations. A patient could go to a uh, emergency care uh, facility in a different city, may or may not tell you about it, you may or may not get lab tests, uh, and again, they may or may not be able to give you a very accurate um, impression of what happened at a particular visit. Uh, and then you have the fact that, that people aren't constantly monitored the way, say, an aircraft is or a, a, some other kinds of systems, a uh, power plant, you're not getting continuous data, you're getting very periodic reporting from the patient uh, at, at just intervals when you might see them, uh, and it can be, uh, again, very noisy and limited. A lot of key information now we're trying to communicate in the way of electronic uh, health records, but we're having real challenges in that a lot of times the data is in there, but it appears to the, the nurse or the physician that it's hidden somewhere in there. They have a lot of menus and screens to wade through. Uh, a lot of times very key data is hidden in very lengthy, wordy, verbal reports. Um, and and we, there's a lot of complaints that they're not necessarily physician-oriented. And physicians are saying, what I really need is an integrated, problem-oriented picture. And we'll talk a little bit later about what that means and what we can do to help facilitate that. Uh, another thing we're finding is that there's really not a lot of support in these systems for transmission of information across the medical team. Medical care is not just one individual, and getting situation awareness across to somebody isn't just talking to one individual, but very often there's a whole team of people who are involved. And you really need support for transmitting information across the team uh, so that we don't lose that, that shared situation awareness that's needed for supporting decision making in that team. And I'm going to talk about that in a lot more detail as well. And, and a final major challenge here is that uh, this is a system where the whole issue of follow-up and feedback is really spotty. So uh, just getting feedback on, to, is the patient um, taking the medication that was prescribed? Is it working out for them? Are they having problems or side effects? Did they even get the prescription filled? That sort of follow-up and feedback tends to be very inconsistent and not supported. A patient may go off, it, a system or a, a particular intervention didn't work for them, and you may not hear about it for months. So that the whole issue of, of uh, follow-up and feedback is, is we, we found a, a significant problem across the healthcare system. So why do we care about situation awareness? Why does it matter? Well, we've done a lot of studies this in, in different domain areas, and we found that it's one of the key factors associated with accidents and errors in all the domains that we've looked at. So for instance, one study I did looking at situation awareness in commercial uh, air transportation found that 88% of human error was actually problems with situation awareness. So it wasn't that people were bad decision makers. It wasn't that they were unable to carry out actions. It's that they were fundamentally challenged in understanding what was happening in the situation in order to be able to, in order to, be able to act in, in a, uh, the timely fashion. Uh, there have been other studies in our traffic control that have found similar issues in the 60 to 70 percent uh, range. Um, a recent study looked at situation awareness and anesthesiology in uh, adverse events uh, in uh, the anesthesi anesthesiology domain, and they found problems with situation awareness in 74 percent of those cases where they had patient deaths or brain damage in, uh, in an anesthesiology care setting. So it's, it's a significant challenge uh, in a lot of these different domains. And of course, many of you are familiar with the uh, studies that have been done looking at human error in medicine. Uh, it's one of the uh, major causes of death in uh, the uh, healthcare domain. And there are a lot of these kinds of problems with poor communication, disconnected reporting systems, poor system design, monitoring failures, problems with automation, inadequate assessments that really all relate to problems with situation awareness. So we know this is a major issue and we know that it has a major impact on the outcomes in uh, healthcare settings. And this sort of data really drives me to this sort of a picture of the world, and that is if we really want to improve performance and decision making in these environments, let's improve situation awareness. If you can just help people understand what's going on with the situation, uh, physicians, nurses, they're highly trained people, they really care about uh, what they're doing. If you can help them form good pictures of the situation, then you can do a huge amount to really boost their ability to make good decisions and carry out uh, uh, effectively in these kinds of environments. 
So we really focused on how do we improve situation awareness given all of these challenges that we talked about in order to improve uh, overall uh, decision quality. So backing up a little bit, I'm going to have a few slides here where I'm just going to talk about uh, what we know about situation awareness, how people do situation awareness uh, in the brain. And that's really going to drive the answers to how do we design systems to better support those cognitive processes. So, so bear with me for just a little bit. Um, this is an overall cognitive model of situation awareness uh, that's, that's based on a, a really integrated view from all the information we know about um, psychology and, and cognitive psychology and perceptual psychology that's sort of put together in an integrated model uh, that looks at what are all the task and system factors and individual factors that people use to develop good situation awareness and decision making. And I'll, I'll summarize this in, in a couple of slides for you. Basically what, what happens is there's a lot of data out there in the world that people are perceiving, comprehending, and projecting. And if you're just trying to do that in a straight line fashion, it doesn't work very well, quite frankly. Uh, and this is what you see with novices in any different domain, is they're struggling to put together all the pieces and figure out what they should be looking at and integrate that all mentally. And, and it's a very slow process. Uh, and we see this in domain after domain after domain. What happens is with experience and expertise, you develop some uh, cognitive models, uh, mental models, if you will, of that domain that help you do this much more effectively. So over time, if you are a, a physician, you might develop a mental model of how the body works. And you use that to understand, well, if, if uh, temperature's going this way and, and pressure's going that way, you know, what, what do I expect to be happening uh, to, to volume, for instance, in, in understanding blood transfusions? Um, if you're uh, looking at mental models of diseases, you understand how diseases progress in, in a particular body system. Those mental models are what really allows you to do comprehension and projection. If you're, you're sitting here trying to do, figure it off from scratch, you're never going to get there. Having good, well-developed mental models is essentially what you learn over time. Whether you're a pilot in an airplane or a physician in an office or an air traffic controller, it's understanding a mental model of, of whatever system it is you're working with. Those systems can be physical systems, but they're also organizational systems. So for instance, you might learn a mental model of how healthcare works in your particular organization. Um, and those sorts of mental models are also appropriate for understanding how things work and what you need to do. But those mental models drive comprehension projection. The second really critical thing that you learn with expertise are schema. And schema are simply patterns, recognize typical patterns of situations. So if you're a physician, you've seen these patterns over and over and over again, and you will recognize at a glance, this person's um, blood pressure is low, uh, they're pale, that's most likely we need to look at these kinds of, of cases that, it, that it's probably related to. Um, that pattern matching is something you learn with repeated exposure to these kind of events. Uh, typically in the medical uh, domain, they might learn those in doing rounds as a resident where they're exposed to lots of different cases. And they develop this whole repertoire, this whole library of typical cases. Um, that allows a situation where it's to be very fast. You're just doing rapid pattern matching and looking for matches to known cases. And you can do very fast comprehension projection based on that. The last thing I'll say that happens here that's, that's important to understand is the, the, the importance of goals. So people don't just sit here and wait for data to hit them in the face. That's very ineffective processing. What they have are goals, and they're doing goal-driven processing. So if you're driving in a car, for instance, you may be looking for particular street signs to navigate it to, in order to navigate. You're looking for certain information to, you say you want to change lanes, you know which information to look for that's relevant to changing lanes. Your goals drive which subsets of information you're going to look for. The same is true in healthcare. Uh, if I suspect this person has disease X, I'm gonna drive, it's going to drive my look and, and gathering of certain kinds of data, certain kinds of information that are going to be important for trying to, to um, pursue that kind of thing. So your, your goals are really relevant to how you're gathering information, how you're integrating it, and uh, really drive your whole uh, decision process. And what we find in these domains is people have to be able to rapidly switch from goal-driven processing, where I'm just looking for certain things, to data-driven processing where really important things jump out at me. And where errors happen is when I'm just looking at certain subsets because I'm pursuing this goal, and something important's happened over here, and I don't notice it, right? Or I'm not processing it. Or I explain it away to fit my mental model, which is often what happens. And that's, that's where our challenge is, is you have to constantly switch between pursuing information for a goal, let's just say it was lane switching in a car, 
I'm looking for that information to change lanes, but I better be alert enough to realize I've got another car that's incurring and uh, going to do an incursion into my lane. So you have to have open that data-driven processing while you're simultaneously trying to do data-driven processing uh, to be uh, efficient. That, in a nutshell, is what's going on with situation awareness over and over and over again in this dynamic, ongoing loop, where my comprehension and my projection are being used to drive gathering more data and more information to fit that mental model and to fill in and understand, is this what's really happening? Is this, has something changed? Do I need to switch from, from um, working on uh, um, giving a patient a particular kind of, of treatment to saying, whoa, wait a minute, I've got something else going on here that's more important that I need to switch over to, to dealing with. That's the ongoing process. All right, that's all, that's all sort of the background I'm gonna give you because that drives everything else in terms of how we want to design those systems to support that kind of a cognitive process. All right, so what goes wrong in this? Um, why, why is that hard? It sounded pretty straightforward, right? Well, in looking at situation awareness across a lot of different domain areas, I've come up with several what I call SA demons, and these are the common challenges that people have in lots of different domains in doing that process effectively. The first is attentional tunneling, okay, tunnel vision. And we see this over and over and over where somebody gets very absorbed in solving this particular problem and they lose track of those other things that are happening to say I need to really switch out. So I'm really focused on changing lanes and I lose track of what's happening around me. I'm not paying attention to my speed or to other cars that are going to have an incursion, for example. In the medical domain, this can be uh, a real challenge. A person may be, uh, for instance, in an operating room, the surgeon is really concentrating on solving a particular problem, and they lose awareness of some of the other kinds of, of cues and changes that are happening in that environment around them. Requisite memory trap. I see this in lots and lots of environment where we require people to remember stuff, okay? So for example, we had a problem with an air traffic controller who cleared an airplane onto a runway that she had already put another airplane on. She couldn't see that runway. So she, she forgot, she missed that information. We see it in the healthcare environment where you require people to remember what it is they've done or haven't done in a particular case, for example, or to remember what was it I gave you the last time. How much are we requiring them to remember stuff? People aren't good at that. They're good at a lot of things, but short-term memory, remembering over time, not nearly as good at. So we need to really simplify systems so we're not requiring people to remember things. Computers are great at that. What I call WAFOs, workload fatigue and other stressors. So one of the things that happens is we've got limited working memory for integrating and processing information. People only have so much room to do that in. And when you're under high workload, when you're under stress, when you're, under, when you're fatigued, that working memory essentially gets reduced because part of it gets used up in dealing with the stressor. So what do we do in, in medical care? How, many, how long of uh, um, terms do we have people working? You know, 10 hour, 12 hour, 14 hour, 24 hour shifts? All we're doing is introducing stress and you're increasing the likelihood that people are gonna make errors because they've got less, less working memory in order to integrate information. They've got less working memory to remember things that they have done or needs to do. Those sorts of things uh, introduce natural error into that uh, system. So we need to, even more so in these kinds of environments, protect that limited working memory for integrating information. The fourth one I call misplaced salience, and this is the Las Vegas Strip phenomenon. Have you ever driven around the road in Las Vegas and you've got flashing lights and bright colors and everything's buying for your attention, right? <clears throat> you see this a lot when you go out onto the internet and you've got you know, little symbols that are jumping up and down and you've got alerts going off and all kinds of things happening. All of those things are grabbing your attention, okay? That makes it really hard to do efficient information integration because while I'm trying to do it, all these things are fighting for my attention. So salient cues are things like bright lights, certain colors, alarms, alerts, all of those things we're pre-wired, it's the way our brains work, we're pre-wired to pay attention to those salient cues. Instead of using every color in the rainbow on your screen, we need to use things like color and motion really, really carefully so that they're only used for really, really important information. And understanding which information is really important to use those things for turns out to be a large part of the trick of designing good systems so that the salient things are, that the important things are salient, not the unimportant things. 
complexity creep. Um, I see this in a lot of systems, and that is that as time goes on, we make systems more and more complex. <clears throat> it starts with doing 10 functions, and then people want it to do a little bit more, and so we add 12 functions, we add 15 functions, and pretty, certain, pretty soon it does 13 different things uh, in all these different modes, and we increase the complexity of the system. Well, what does complexity do to situation awareness? It makes it harder to develop those mental models I talked about, right? So it's very complex. We find that people actually only know how to use even certain subsets of it. They can't find what they're looking for. They don't understand what it's going to do in a particular situation. That complexity actually works against situation awareness. So keeping it simple actually is, is much better for supporting situation awareness and decision making. The next one is errant mental models. And we see this a lot where people mismatch what they think is happening to their mental model of what's going on. Uh, there's, there's a large uh, amount of this that happens in the medical care arena where you get an early diagnosis of something and that wrong mental model then is used to interpret all the remaining cues and information that you get. And so people will um, keep fitting that data to the wrong mental model. And even though it should have alerted them that diagnosis A wasn't really right, it should be diagnosis B, they'll stick with diagnosis A for a long time because they've gotten this wrong mental model from early initial information. <clears throat> so that can be a significant problem. <clears throat> and then the last one that I'll, that I'll talk about that's a big problem in a lot of arenas is automation. And so one of the ways that uh, I think we as engineers have tried to deal with a lot of the challenges in these domains is we're going to automate stuff. We'll make it easier for the user by automating things. But automation has its own challenges. The biggest one of these is the out of the loop syndrome. And so we have a large history now of uh, data that's showing that when you automate things, people get out of the loop. They lose situation awareness of what's happening. <coughs> and the best um, description I can give to this is um, have you ever been to a party with someone else and they were driving and you were the passenger? At the end of the night, you find out you've got to be the one to drive home. Do you understand how you got there as well as if you'd been the one driving? And the answer is no, because we're, we're not good at being passive processors of information. And so what we're doing to people with automation is we're often turning them into monitors. People are not good monitors. And we're not, we, we don't have as good an understanding of what's going on when we're just passively processing and watching. Even if we're watching very carefully, by, by going from being active pro information processors to passive processors, we've essentially become passengers in that vehicle, if you will. So this is one of the big challenges with automation, and I can talk more about that later. But we know that just trying to, we can't just automate our way out of this problem. <clears throat> and we have to look very carefully at how we use automation in these systems. <clears throat> we've done a lot of work looking at um, um, what kinds of essay problems that people have in different domain areas. Uh, this one I'm going to present is from a study of anesthesiologists that was recently done. And they found that 42% of situation awareness errors in the anesthesiology domain was, were, were what I call level one problems, where people just weren't getting the basic information. Uh, very often this could have been because of, of visual or auditory uh, barriers, if you will. A lot of times, though, just the information never got to that person. Something wasn't being monitored. Some data wasn't sent across the system. Um, there was measurement error. These are things like noisy sensors, for example, uh, poor lab tests, uh, misreading or mishearing uh, values. <clears throat> and in a lot of cases, the information's all there, but it's buried somewhere in their system. So they're looking over here when really it's over there. And that's a real challenge in these environments. In 29% of the cases, it was an issue of uh, comprehension. And that was they didn't understand the information that they got. And there we see these issues of mismatching cues to the wrong di diagnosis or having the wrong mental model. Or maybe they had no mental model of that, that situation at all. They didn't have, have ever developed a mental model for a particular uh, kind of case. And then another 29%, it was a uh, failure project. So they had an idea of what was going on now, but they weren't projecting what was coming down the line in that environment. Um, by the way, when I've done similar studies in aviation, I found 78% were SA level one problems. So 
<coughs> this is not uh, unusual. I don't know how it would track to a different kind of healthcare settings like, like primary care. Uh, I would say you probably have an even higher percentage of just not getting basic data in that environment, but those studies have not been done yet. But it gives you sort of an idea of, of where people are having challenges. So, so far I've only talked about situation awareness in terms of the individual. But uh, as I mentioned earlier, we also have a lot of team operations in healthcare. There are a lot of people who are involved in healthcare. It could be physicians, uh, physician assistants, nurses at different levels, administrators, all kinds of people are actually involved in uh, the healthcare operation. And you need a lot of support to do synchronization and joint action of these individuals uh, in order to support that kind of, of process. And when we talk about this, we're really talking about this idea of team situation awareness. And what we're trying to do here is to optimize decision making across that whole team. Uh, and sometimes, these, sometimes it might be within a team, let's say within a particular healthcare setting. A lot of times it might be between teams. So we have different healthcare settings, different organizations uh, that are administering different parts of the care, and you're trying to integrate and coordinate information across these different healthcare settings. Um, generally, we, we have two separate concepts here. One is this whole idea of, of team essay. And that's the idea that everybody needs to have the essay that's required for his or her job. So if the nurse knows information but doesn't pass it to the physician that's administering care, for instance, that's a, that's a break in the chain. And that physician may need that information for performing that, their, their, uh, their job. And then we have this idea of shared essay. And that's a subset of information we need to have in common. Now, everybody doesn't need to know everything about everybody else's business. That turns out to just be complete overload. So you really have to understand very carefully what is it that needs to be shared within these teams where we really need to be on the same page and have a common picture. And that's one thing that, that we can do when we start really breaking down and looking at what people's essay requirements are is specifically identify what that needs to be in the team. And we find that, that people getting on the same page in these settings and developing shared essay is, is really critical. Um, they spend a lot of time trying to understand, um, you know, what's, what's the status of the patient? Do they have, a, they have that shared understanding? What's been done so far? What are they doing now? How is what they're doing going to affect me, or how is what I'm doing going to affect them? Um, I, we found in, in studying uh, situation awareness in primary care settings that the nurses would gather a lot of information beforehand, and they really wanted ways to be able to communicate that to the physician. And some of this might be things that were in the medical record, but very often it might be subtle social information about what was going on in the patient's life that they really needed to understand because they wouldn't necessarily uh, communicate that with, with the physician or vice versa. Um, they need to understand what people were doing next. Uh, nurses wanted to be able to assist the physician, take a lot of workload off of them, but they couldn't do that unless they really understood what their priorities were and what their tasks are. And one of the things we found was electronic health records didn't do much to help support this overall team tasking and team status and information sharing that was really, really critical to uh, this environment. In, in looking at uh, Team SA, there's been a lot of research looking at this, and we find that there's a lot of systems where this kind of information basically falls between the cracks, where it really never gets communicated between person A and person B, and we have a lot of accidents and incidents that we can talk about where um, uh, that information fell between the cracks and, and therefore uh, a poor decision making or, or major accident happened. The other thing that we find is that particularly between teams, that shared essay tends to be very, very low. Um, those links are very weak and they're very easily broken. A lot of the communication that happens is, is a very low level information and particularly sharing higher levels of information is very difficult between, between these different teams. So when we, we talk about uh, Team SA, we get these failures where one, just basic information isn't getting passed. They never get a chance to tell them that basic data. But more importantly, we find that they're also not sharing that higher level comprehension and projection. And you and I may look at the same cue and interpret it completely differently because we have different shared mental, mo different mental models, right? We have different understanding. So uh, what may be very obvious to one physician with one particular kind of, of uh, medical background may not be obvious at all to another one who has a completely different set of mental models, particularly different set of experiences. Unless you share those higher level understandings very explicitly, um, a lot of information can be lost. 
And then projection. Do people form the same projections of what's going to happen? You know, if I say you have diabetes, do you form the same projection of what that, what that, how that's going to change over time or what kinds of interventions are appropriate or what things you should be looking for over time uh, as the next person might? And we find that in teams, a lot of times, those sorts of, of things are not getting articulated in ways that would help this sort of uh, uh, team situation awareness. So these are some of the kinds of problems then that we see. Uh, very often, different teams aren't aware of what information has to be passed across them. Uh, one person doesn't know what the other person already knows. Sometimes you know, we've had aircraft accidents uh, uh, happen because uh, uh, flight attendants could see information that they never bothered to tell the pilots in the cockpit because they assumed, oh, the pilots already know that. And actually, they didn't. And how much is this happening in the healthcare setting where nurses might know information that they don't communicate to the physician? Or the physicians know things, but they haven't had an easy way to articulate that to their staff to assist in that task properly. Uh, and, and in particular, we found a lot of teams will communicate the lower level data, but not necessarily the implications of that, the higher levels of SA. We also find very often there's not much good support for team processes between these different organizations. They have very few, uh, few shared devices. So right now, my electronic health record is in my organization, and yours is in your organization. And getting uh, interop uh, interoperability, sharing of information across those systems is still pretty limited in a lot of these um, different uh, kinds of uh, settings. Um, shared displays are often inadequate. So uh, even within my, my team, my system may not be supporting shared SA between me and the rest of my team that's providing health care to the same patient, even within my organization. And then we find that in many of these settings, the culture may not support direct communication. The physician may be like, I'm busy, don't bother me and the nurses are afraid to go and tell them this stuff verbally, for instance, or they may not have opportunities for communication because the physician's bouncing between rooms so quickly. Uh, they're trying to you know, lay in wait to catch them uh, while they're trying to do their other tasks. So these are real opportunities where I think the, uh, the, the electronic health record can help in supporting these kinds of, of communications that need to occur. Uh, and then, of course, uh, it may get interpreted differently. And one of the things you have to do with this is you have to be sure to make explicit in the health record what these implications are in terms of, of comprehension and projection. And that's one of the things that we recommend in the design site. OK, so that's sort of some of the background information on SA. Let's talk about what does this mean for the design of systems and how we try to improve situation awareness uh, through electronic health records. Right now, we have a challenge of, of data overload. And that is our technology has taken us from you know, the old-timey system where, where Physicians may have had very little information to now we have a whole morass of data, tests, uh, ex x-rays, exams, everything else, imaging, that's all available. But finding what you're looking for has become the real challenge. Uh, they just can't find what they're looking for. And, th and this has led to what I call the information gap. And that is there's all of this data that's out there being produced, but people still have to sort through it, find what they're looking for, it, mentally integrate it and process it to come up with what it is they really wanted to know in the first place. And that's the real challenge that we see. People say they're, they're, sw they're uh, 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 swimming in data. And, and I think that's, that's the absolute uh, truth, uh, but, but not in information. Information is what I really needed to know. Um, there are a lot of challenges right now with electronic health records. Um, this is uh, the results of a recent meta-analysis that was done looking at usability problems across a wide variety of electronic health records, uh, 50 different studies in the meta-analysis. And these are some of the usability problems that they found in these systems where uh, one, they weren't, they weren't what, what people call natural. They weren't, uh, it was hard to have familiarity with matching it to what they were trying to do in their workflow. There was a lot of inconsistency in terms of, of usage patterns, locations, colors even across the same system. Uh, there were challenges with, with a lack of error prevention. So it was very easy to make mistakes um, there were lots of cutting and pasting errors, particularly with templating systems. Uh, there, was real, there was problems with wrong uh, patients and record matching, even within, within patients. Uh, users are reporting very high cognitive loads because it requires a lot of memory reliance on the systems. Uh, there, was, there was problems with data overload, but also a lot of the data they had didn't necessarily have relevance to the kinds of problems they were trying to solve. Uh, and very little support for task status. Where were they in, in issuing an order, for example, or in doing particular tasks for a particular patient. 
Uh, there was reporting of a lot of uh, inefficient interaction, where it took lots of steps to do things, lots of visual search. They didn't have a good overview and understanding of even what was going on with, with a particular patient. And, it, and they got lost in all of these dialogues and pop-ups that would occur in the system that they'd have to wade through to do what they needed to do. Um, not good feedback. So they didn't necessarily know what the system had done once they pushed that button. Uh, was, it, was it executing? What was the uh, consequence of an action they took? Or what was, what was the status of a particular task? They would lose visibility into that. Uh, and then basic issues with uh, language usage that were maybe ambiguous or didn't match well with, with what they were used to. And then challenges with um, ineffective information presentation. So uh, again, how that information was organized, they'd have to wade through lots of screens and menus to find what they were looking for in ways that didn't match uh, what they were looking, uh, the way they needed to do their tasks. So these are general problems, but they're very common problems across really the entire uh, EHR uh, system when, when you've looked at all of these different uh, studies. And many companies, to be fair, are really trying to address these. And we've seen them putting in Band-Aids to some of these things, but a lot of them they're still really struggling with. How do we make these systems more user-centered? Uh, we know we want to make them physician-centered or, or nurse-centered. We know we want to, to make it easier for people to do things and avoid some of these problems. How do you really do that effectively? And I think that's where they've, they've uh, struggled some with. So what I want to do is take what we've talked about with situation awareness and say, how do we apply that to solving some of these kinds of challenges? And I think you have to start with this whole issue of why do we have data overload? Why is it so hard for people to find what, what they're looking for? And the basic reason that I found in, in domain after domain is that we've, we've got all of these systems now for, for gathering data. We have new tests here. We have new imaging places. We have all of these different ways and techniques for gathering data. And that's just growing as we see patients be able to do a lot of at-home monitoring, for example. We're going to be adding in lots more data. And what we've done is we've just sort of added that all together, and we expect the user to be the one who integrates and understands how that applies to a particular problem. And that's just this, this let the user figure it out has just really mentally overloaded them. Okay? They, they can't necessarily do that. Right now, physicians are reporting on average 15 hours a week spent after hours just trying to maintain uh, the, the electronic health record and the documentation that they have to do. And they're, they're really complaining of burnout and overload. Uh, that's not a situation that has to exist. We can do a lot to avoid these kinds of problems. Uh, because if you just sort of add it all together and say, like the user do it, people can't. We just end up with what we call human error uh, or medical error and bad outcomes uh, from doing that. Because people can really only adapt so far. So what, where I'm advocating here is more of a user-centered design philosophy. And that design, design philosophy says, let's take all that data that's out there. We're bringing it all together and integrating it. But we have to put it together in a way that basically integrates it around what they're trying to do, which is their situation awareness. Let's help them form integrated pictures of situation that map to their, their goals and their mental models that they're trying to build. And if we can do that, if we can integrate it around the needs of the decision maker, they can very rapidly understand what's happening with the situation and move on to the things that they're trained in, which is how to make good medical decisions based on an understanding of what's going on. That has a lot of benefits. One, it's much more rapid. We've done a lot of that mental integration for them. Uh, they're going to be much better at doing that whole decision-making process because they're not digging around trying to find things or getting lost in screens. <clears throat> and you get, better, you get better outcomes, better productivity. It's faster. You reduce a lot of that um, overhead time. And actually, your users are much happier with a system like that because they're there to, to present care to the, uh, the patients. They don't want to be lost in, in using technology. Nice philosophy, how, how do we get there? And I think this has sort of been the, the fundamental uh, challenge of the information age, is overcoming that information gap, all of that data, to integrate it into this, this supported uh, picture of what's going on. So what I'm going to talk about is what I call essay-oriented design. And essay-oriented design really caps a lot of other design guidance that's out there. So we have the whole human factors uh, research base, which is, has been around for 60 years that understands you know, things like knobs and dials and visual pres information presentation. We know a lot about ergonomics, the physical fit of the system. And then we have a lot of data now in, in human-computer interaction, which are, are good ways of applying this in a, in a computer interface. But all of that data is really focused around, um, I'll say, the perceptual or physical features of the system. 
We know that text needs to be this high. We know we have these kinds of color contrast ratios. Uh, we know that this is a good design for a drop-down menu, for example. Uh, they're the basics there, that's great, but it doesn't address, I think, situation awareness, which is really about information and understanding. And so when I talk about SRN design, it sits on top of those other principles that says, here's how to systematically go about understanding what kind of information people need and how to integrate it to support their understanding. And, and that's, that's the whole goal of SRN design. So SRN design is really a, uh, it's a three-stage process. It starts with understanding what are the SA requirements of an individual user. And we have a particular process we go through to do, uh, to do that process. And this has been done now for literally hundreds and hundreds of different domains and different user types uh, to, to really understand what are their goals, what are their decisions, and then what really are their SA requirements. It's what allows us to understand situation awareness unique for a physician in a primary care setting, or an anesthesiologist, or a nurse, or a pilot. They're all very different, and we use a, a goal-directed task analysis to understand that. It's followed by a, a design process that we, we've developed uh, design principles based on, on all of the research in this area to say, here's how you support SA, and then measurement, because I'm very big on, uh, after we create designs, we really want to test those. And we do usability testing. We might look at their performance. We might look at their workload. We can also measure their situation awareness to see how effective particular display integrations are to see if we've done our job right. And then we can iterate those. I'm going to talk about each one of these stages. So to start with um, is the, the GDTA, the Goal-Directed Task Analysis. And uh, because goals are really central to how people integrate information, we start with an overall goal structure for a particular individual. <clears throat> this one was done for the Centers for Disease Control, where we were looking at SA monitoring across the public health system. Uh, and we create this hierarchical goal tree. So for instance, their major goal was taking the actions needed for significant public health events. And then below those, those are sub-goals, things like identifying public health events, engaging uh, the uh, exchange critical public health information, determining actions needing to respond to significant public health events, tracking the effectiveness of responses, and assuring preparedness. Those were sort of their major goals. And you break these all down into sub-goals. And when you've got to the lowest level of a sub-goal then, uh, what are the key decisions that they're trying to make? And, over, and you can really categorize these very effectively for a given decision maker uh, as to, to what are their decisions. So for instance, for the goal of determining public health significance of events, uh, their key decision is, what's the significance of the event to CDC resources and personnel? That's just one of the decisions they were trying to make. And your essay requirements are a function of those decisions. And what this gives us is not just a laundry list of, I want to know these 52 pieces of data, but how do those pieces of data get integrated? So I know exactly what data they need at the perception level, how that's integrated into comprehension and into projection. So for example, in this case, uh, they needed to know four different pieces of data, event characteristics, changes in those characteristics, location of personnel, and proximity to the event. The, the comprehension they were trying to make is how does that impact their personnel, and then the, the projection they were make is the projected impact of the event on, on personnel. These are very detailed kinds of things. They, they can be anywhere from three or four pages for a very simple job to 60 or 70 pages for a complex kind of, kind of job. But they really form the basis and the backbone of understanding what, what they need for situation awareness. So I know not just data, but I know how it has to be integrated. And that gives me a lot of information for going in into my system design. The design principles then, we have 50 design principles. Um, some of these are at a very basic level, general principles I'm going to show you. Um, but there's also a lot of very specific uh, kinds of things that we find are applicable in a lot of domains. One of these is confidence and uncertainty. In every single domain I've been in, it turns out how confident people are in the data is a very important component of SA. So people need to understand not just uh, that particular piece of information, but how reliable was that test that it came from, for example. Um, how reliable was, was this data? We, did we collect it in our organization? Did they get it from somebody else? Was this patient reported, or did the nurse take the measurement? And which nurse was it? Those kinds of things are very important for understanding confidence. And we have a whole set of principles that are associated with how to directly support understanding information confidence in the display. Most systems don't do that. You're stuck trying to guess what, what, how, much, how confident something is, and you're trying to explore that. 
So we try to make that directly obvious in the display. There's a whole section on dealing with complexity and, and complex environments where you have lots of data and lots of complex happenings going on with a particular system. Um, another section has to do with alarms. So in a lot of systems I look at, people say, oh, I know how to solve the essay problem. I'm going to give them an alarm when this happens. So I'll give them an alert for this, an alert for that, an alert for that, and pretty soon they've got 52 alerts and warnings, and they don't know what half of those mean. Uh, and that's a real problem in the medical arena, particularly if you go into environments where you have a lot of technologies, all of which have their own alarms, and you'll find a lot of them have been disabled because they tend to be very noisy, they tend to have a lot, a lot of false alarm rate, and the cry wolf syndrome works in such a way that they just start ignoring them. Uh, we see these in um, healthcare records where you have lots of dialogues, uh, you know, warning boxes, and they just go click, 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 because they're trying to get rid of all those annoying boxes, which aren't meaningful most of the time. So we have a whole different approach to that, to saying how do you keep people aware of critical information but not overwhelm them with a lot of these alerts. Uh, there's a whole section on automation and how do we try to keep people in the loop and aware of what's happening when we use automation in, in these systems. <clears throat> and then another section on um, supporting Team SA in organizations that I think are all applicable to, to what's going on in your environment. So if I just gave you an example of some of these, <clears throat> Our first principle has to do with integrating information. Instead of having systems which take you through a linear step, a linear, linear process flow that doesn't work, instead we organize information around goals and allow the users to switch very rapidly between goals. If goals are a critical way that people organize and integrate information and decisions, let's use those to integrate the displays and that allows them to do this dynamic goal switching that's very critical in these environments. What we find with linear task flows is that um, there's so much variability in how people go through task sequences, both between organizations, between users, and even, even with the same user between different, different uh, patients, where this flow doesn't necessarily work, they have to interrupt it and go to that one and then interrupt that and go to this, that no matter how you try to do a linear task flow process, it never really works very well. You're always going to be wrong. By going to more of a goal-based structure, you allow the user to very rapidly jump between where they, where they need to go with the information all integrated within that particular um, <coughs> tab, if you will, so that they can uh, address those problems more readily. Principle two, support level two SA directly. In the vast majority of systems, you make people figure out what's the meaning or significance of information. High, high overload, and it doesn't translate well between different users on the team. So instead of having to read everything and try and figure out what's most important, what's critical, directly support them in that area. This is a tremendous opportunity for where we can apply things like machine learning and information fusion is in supporting some of those higher level assessments that people are trying to make. And then very similar level uh, uh, number three is directly support those projections. Even very experienced decision makers have a hard time figuring out how information is going to trend over time. That's a very mentally loading kind of thing. Help them with things, simple things like timelines and graphs go a long way. Not, not sure you can have a crystal ball, but and help them in understanding how things are changing over time. Support Directly support their understanding of how information is trending. And that will do a lot to help them with projections. Supporting global SA is helping them understand across competing goals what's happening with a particular situation so they don't get lost in that tunnel vision always keep the big picture up so they're not getting, getting trapped in those sorts of uh, things. And then uh, very similar to that, uh, don't block the picture. I really hate pop-ups. They cover up the big picture of understanding what's going on and get you lost very easily in this rabbit hole. Keep, let, them, let them maintain that big picture of what's going on with that patient. Uh, and then uh, uh, making critical cues for activation salient. Um, so this has to do with that information salience. Uh, I actually advocate using fairly uh, uh, bland colors in the display so that really important things are, are mapped to colors because that's something that the eye really triggers on. So something that's, that's critical it's, is red and it really pops out of the display. Something that's really good is green and you can really tell that at a glance. Um, we really look for inf understanding information at a glance when you look at a display. You shouldn't have to spend you know, a long time wading through it to mentally process information. Um, let me just give you an example of this. So for that CDC example, we went from our GDTA to directly map into what an integrated display might, might look like. 
Uh, this was a graphical information, uh, graphical uh, representation of events. And you can see, let's see if I, does this work? Well, I can't, I don't have a pointer. But you can see that um, you, on the graph, you can see critical events that are happening that they were trying to track and what their status is uh, in that geographical display. Um, they had a table that let them look at uh, understanding those, those events and the key information regarding it. One of the things that we found in doing this analysis is that there were really six things they cared about in displays, in, uh, in situations that they were trying to analyze. And that was how a particular event was impacting uh, the health of the community, how it was impacting on the CDC personnel, how it was impacting the media. So for, for example, um, uh, whether or not vaccines cause autism wasn't actually having a health event, but it was having a major media event, for example. Um, how it was affecting security, how it was affecting um, politics, and how it was affecting infrastructure, things like transportation. And that's what they really wanted to know at a glance. And the, the uh, public health environment is such that um, they have lots of epidemiologists who might be specialized in particular diseases, but to have the head of the CDC understand at a glance what was happening, who didn't necessarily have all of those different specialties, it allowed you to combine the information and understanding across lots of different uh, specialists of what was really going on with a particular kind of event. So that was a, a very useful structure in, in this particular case for getting that level two essay across. And uh, you could very easily click between different views of information. So this was a geographical view. They could also look at graphical views and timeline views uh, of the information. So this is what I mean by an overview uh, kind of display. Um, but mapping back to the, the GDTA, uh, the gold arrested task analysis, you could also see the detailed levels that went, that went behind that. So the, uh, in this case, uh, up in the corner, the uh, healthcare event is red, so we know it's critical. Here's all the data that goes into understanding why it's critical and, and all integrated in one place of the information they needed to know. Uh, and these were roll up, roll down, so you could manage uh, lots of uh, data in ways that were very simple and intuitive. You weren't having to page through screens, which people are really uh, loath to do, to understand what was going on with, with the details for any particular event. Um, this is uh, showing how we were getting comprehension. You could, again, you could see those criticality areas. Uh, and these, the criticality of these different events and how they, how they looked at. You could look at them in different areas. And we have, these were very flexible. And this is ways in which you provide flexibility for the user uh, because users want to be able to explore the data and understand the data in different ways. So they could do things like uh, map against different terrain features, weather, infrastructure, population bases. And they could see the data in, in creative different ways to really explore and understand what was happening uh, with situations. And then here, uh, this is looking sort of at that projection level where they could see what was happening with trends over time. Uh, so they could see, and they needed to see this not, again, as just a graph, for instance, but what were relative events against that graph. So if you have a graph of blood pressure, let's just say, what were relative events in terms of here's where we were giving this medication, here's where we were giving that medication, or here's where this happened or that happened. You need to be able to map in relevant events to, under, to really be able to comprehend the significance of these kinds of data that you're looking at. Uh, in this example, you can see some of those events and what they really need to know are, are things getting better or getting worse. And you can tell that at a glance as well as dig down into the data. So that's just an example of uh, one case where we did this. I've got another example here. I've currently been working with the University of Wisconsin at Madison on a, a project in the primary care setting looking at how do we apply SRM design to better design electronic health records. Uh, this is a project sponsored by the uh, AHRQ. And uh, they spent a lot of time going in and doing these goal-directed task analysis with different kinds of primary care organizations and came up with a, a, a fairly good uh, goal structure. Um, and they did this for physicians. They did this for nurses. Um, they did it for physician assistants and um, uh, different levels of, of nurses. So there was like four or five different users types that they that did these analyses for. But you looked at what was their overall goal. In this case, it was developing high-quality, team-based, patient-centered uh, care efficiently. And then what are their sub-goals? Everything from understanding the current state of the patient and the patient issues, developing the care plan, uh, coordinating communicating to provide care, establishing a trusting relationship and building rapport with patients, 
and completing needed administrative work. And this is how they were really thinking about that. And then broken down below that are our different uh, sub-goals. So um, I'm going to show you some basic wireframes, but for example, one of the goals that we found across the, the, the physician uh, uh, and, and health, uh, primary care setting was this whole idea of building trust and rapport with the patients. Um, this was new to me, this whole idea that they really wanted to understand, okay, they really wanted to understand um, the, the patient uh, at, at, a, at a deeper level, not just their um, symptoms, not just their diseases, but what was their socioeconomic environment? What was their lifestyle? And at a glance, you can tell where critical problems were. We used a blue flag to indicate new information. So something was new was, you know, she fell on the stairs uh, that they needed to really redirect their attention to. And by using color coding, you could tell exactly where they needed to be able to focus attention. We had another status, uh, goal, which was tracking functional status in the care plan. Instead of having to dig through lots of reports, we're mapping this data across the timeline so that you can see how things were changing over time. Uh, you can tell at a glance whether that, that uh, condition was um, being controlled or not controlled and how different medications were impacting on critical, in, uh, critical uh, um, parameters for that particular environment. Uh, so these are just some of the ideas of, of how we're trying to map some of these into uh, looking at these more integrated kinds of displays that really map to physician goals. So uh, in summary, I think SRN design has a lot that it can provide in terms of understanding uh, SA needs of the users and integrating information. Um, it, is, uh, it uses salient very, salience, information salience very uh, critically in order so that the most important information will pop out at you and you have this understanding at a glance. We really minimize waiting through screens. It should never take more than one or two clicks to do any particular action and help people uh, directly support Team SA with a lot of uh, things I didn't show you that are built in there to support uh, that, that team understanding. And uh, I think this is a real opportunity, quite frankly, for uh, companies involved in electronic health records to get around a lot of those kind of challenges that I talked about and provide a whole layer that's really directed at, at the physician and the healthcare team and being able to support decision making and situation awareness that they need uh, to be effective in their operations. Okay, I'll stop there.